it's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, a pleasure to uh, be invited to sort of gather some thoughts around what I think is one of the really pressing issues of our time, uh, which is asylum. Um, uh, seems a bit odd to start off by uh, talking about asylum with a picture of the South Pacific behind me, but um, there's a point to that, and I'll, I will get to that point. Uh, but I want to talk about um, how we came about um, talking about asylum to begin with. Asylum begins with the obligation to provide outsiders admission. Starting point of asylum um, comes about uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, and in particular, a response to um, the complete displacement of tens of millions of people in the aftermath of the war, uh, both in Europe and in Asia, and a feeling of guilt about the way in which uh, a number of countries, among them the United States, had turned away Jewish refugees who were seeking asylum uh, prior to the war and during the war. So in the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, and uh, the United Nations um, uh, gathered together a group uh, of uh, uh, conveners to design what would become a permanent, a more permanent framework um, of, uh, of asylum, of offering refuge. Um, so this took two uh, uh, sort of steps. The first step, the 1951 uh, convention, was uh, immediately addressing that post-World War II uh, displacement of millions of people. Uh, and then at, uh, in 1967, there was a second protocol which extended that initial understanding in the post-war period to a more uh, general kind of um, understanding of what obligation countries had in providing uh, asylum for those who were seeking it. And the key here is that anyone who had a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, and, and nationality, or membership in any particular social group or uh, because of their political opinion, uh, could uh, apply for uh, refuge in another country. Um, so, right, I just want to talk a little bit about um, this, this key distinction here. So, um, when people think about who's applying for asylum, they often think of refugees. Refugees are someone uh, who's been forced to flee their country, again, because of this uh, sense of persecution or, or being persecuted, and or have found, um, uh, sort of been displaced into a third country. And from that third country, they then apply for, for, um, for refuge in, uh, say, the United States, or in the UK, or in France. Um, so the key here is that they're already located um, outside of their original country of origin. And there are uh, quite large numbers of people around the world who have been displaced and are seeking refuge. And so the UNHCR, which again was founded in, after the Second World War, um, uh, is the main international body which is uh, tasked with resettling displaced people, people who are forcibly displaced. Um, and uh, so we're talking about, about uh, in 2021, uh, an estimated 84 million people um, who are displaced for any numbers of, uh, of reasons uh, into third countries, whether as refugees, uh, whether they're internally displaced, whether they're seeking asylum, or, or whether they're stateless. And the... Uh, uh, so there are lots of different examples of this kind of displacement. So this is a picture of the Rohingya refugees um, uh, fleeing into uh, Bangladesh in 2017. And uh, this is a, a photograph of Syrian refugees uh, in 2020 as um, uh, sort of the civil war in Syria is drawing uh, close to its end. Um, the key here is when we're talking about refugees as displaced people, 
um, most refugees are being displaced into an immediately bordering country. Um, and about uh, more, than, more than half are, are uh, being hosted in about five countries, and 85% are, are being hosted in uh, the developing world. So they're not being hosted, uh, say, by, uh, by uh, the United States, for instance. Um, and uh, this ends up being quite important. So asylum seekers um, or refugees who are applying for asylum upon arrival. Um, so instead of being displaced into a third country or being displaced internally, they're, uh, they're arriving at the border at a, at a port of entry and seeking refuge at that port of entry. And the reason why this matters and the reason why we're now talking about the end of asylum is that asylum seekers uh, are seeking entry, are seeking refuge, often not in the developing world, but in the developed world, OECD countries. We're talking about the United States, or Germany, or Sweden, or the UK. Uh, and so these countries become um, the haven which asylum seekers, where asylum seekers are seeking refuge. And so they arrive at the border and they ask for asylum. Um, so an example would be uh, these refugees. This is a photograph of refugees arriving uh, to the island of Lesbos in 2015. Uh, Lesbos is an island uh, just a mile and a half off the coast of Turkey, so uh, essentially a short boat ride. Um, but once they arrived to Lesbos, they were able then to apply for asylum in the EU. Um, and this um, uh, led to a crisis. Um, in 2013 to 2015, there was a migrant crisis in Europe, um, which in some ways appears to look like a successful application of asylum. So in this period, you can see um, between 2013 and 2016, there's a, this dramatic increase in the numbers of people who are applying for asylum in the EU, um, where basically quintuples um, over that time period. And in a period, uh, let's say between 2013 and 2015, you have over 2 million people who are asking for asylum in the EU. Oh, uh, so imagine over 2 million people asking for asylum um, in, in the US and our current uh, conversations about the loss of control over the border and the, what we should do about the southern border in the United States. We, we, um, we, uh, we have not yet uh, uh, reached these kinds of numbers. So over 2 million people asking for asylum. Um, and a large number of them, again, displaced from conflicts in either Syria or Afghanistan, um, applying for asylum in particular to Germany. Um, so Germany receives, uh, this is, uh, these are figures from 2015, but between 2014 and 2015, uh, well over a million asylum applications just to Germany alone. And uh, so Angela Merkel, who uh, just stepped down as, um, as chancellor of Germany, uh, 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 took an admirable position. The position she took was that there was an obligation, Germany had an obligation to accept um, uh, these, these uh, applica applicants for, for asylum um, and uh, saw it as, a, again, in moral terms, a moral duty. Um, however, and uh, despite the fact that Europe did accept many of those asylum applications. Um, it, I would argue it, in fact, signaled uh, the beginning, or at least the middle, of the erosion of asylum for reasons that I'll talk about. So one thing is that public opinion in this period in Europe was uh, quite adamantly against the, uh, uh, these asylum seekers. So uh, immigration was seen as a major problem and uh, so if you look at this map, uh, you know, large percentages of 
uh, of the public across the EU saw uh, uh, immigration as an issue uh, that was uh, critical. Um, most of them uh, also saw it in quite negative ways, um, where uh, uh, you know, refugees or, 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 or asylum seekers uh, were seen uh, um, uh, in sort of disapproving terms. Um, and, uh, and this shaped the way that policymakers um, saw that, that, uh, that moment, but, um, but also um, sort, of, uh, sort of engendered this determination that they would never repeat this moment again. So they were willing to see this as a one-off. They were accepted an obligation to, ex to uh, accept this this, um, these two million uh, asylum seekers. Um, but as we'll see, um, the pressure was uh, to harden the borders, to uh, deter future asylum seekers. And um, in response, the EU began making a set of deals. Um, so in this period between 2014 and 2016, the EU began reaching out to essentially gatekeeping countries and uh, striking either formal or informal deals to block uh, future asylum seekers from reaching Europe. Um, so uh, almost immediately uh, 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 between 2014 and 2015, um, Merkel was, as she was saying, there was a moral obligation to accept asylum seekers into Germany. She was also talking with Turkey and offering a, a payment, a lump sum of 4 billion euros every year so that Turkey would serve as um, a, uh, a gatekeeper for Europe. And so blocking uh, the crossing of asylum seekers into, into Greece. Um, likewise, in 2013, 2014, uh, uh, Italy began reaching out to Libya, which in that uh, period was uh, already falling into uh, sort of disarray. Um, the Italian Navy began having conversations with uh, Libyan militias along the, board, along the coast and going essentially from militia to militia uh, and striking individual deals with each militia. So that uh, enforcing what was called the Libyan Coast Guard, uh, which it was a, a purely a, made up organization um, where the militias would serve as the enforcers um, keeping boats from leaving the Libyan coast uh, to, uh, and preventing them from landing on, on Italian soil. Um, likewise with Niger, uh, there has been an agreement uh, with the Niger government to, um, uh, or the Nigerian government to uh, uh, serve as a, as a barrier to migrants moving from from the sub-Saharan Africa, um, um, who were then moving northward to Libya, uh, again, to slow down or prevent that migration. So this, these side deals um, were uh, actually remarkably effective. So if you look at the period uh, where uh, the asylum uh, uh, peaks around 2015, 2016, uh, immediately after those deals are struck, between 2016 and 2017, you see this, again, quite dramatic uh, reduction in the numbers of uh, asylum seekers in the EU, and not because any of the crises which had sparked those asylum, uh, those asylum waves had ended, because they didn't, um, but because they were um, prevented from actually arriving uh, to the EU. Um, so this idea of externalizing asylum seeking, preventing asylum seekers from actually arriving to the border to make a claim for asylum did not come out of nowhere. Um, um, the United States, uh, as with so many things, is an innovator uh, in this kind of policy. So um, in between 1989, 1991, uh, the US was grappling with a Haitian vote uh, uh, people who were uh, leaving Haiti to arrive to the United States, particularly arriving to Florida, um, and then almost immediately right after uh, with the Mariel boat lift um, from Cuba. And those two instances, which uh, both ended up with you know, tens of thousands of people arriving to the United States and claiming asylum, but 
both those instances led to a shifting of US policy uh, where, in the case of Haitians, Haitian boats that were uh, interdicted at sea were then turned back, and Haitians were repatriated without ever setting foot on uh, US soil. And in the case of Cuba, um, under the Clinton administration, the US changed its policy to a uh, dry foot, wet foot policy. So if Cuban migrants were interdicted at sea, they were returned to Cuba. If they somehow managed to arrive to the United States and set foot on, the United, on US soil, then they could uh, uh, ask for asylum. Um, but it's a, it's a strange policy. But the US began this policy of trying to push asylum seekers away to prevent them from actually making contact, making physical contact with US soil so that they could claim asylum. Um, and other countries have since followed similar kinds of policies. So I began with that picture of the South Pacific. Um, and it, 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 Australia in 2013 uh, began a similar kind of policy. Australia was um, uh, receiving asylum seekers who were crossing the straits between Papua New Guinea to Christmas Island on the map. Uh, so Christmas Island is technically part of Australia. Um, it's, again, only a few miles away from Papua New Guinea. So again, uh, so asylum seekers from, from Afghanistan, from Bangladesh, could, could cross over um, and claim asylum once they had arrived at Christmas Island. Um, so Australia uh, devised this solution, which was to, uh, again, create side deals with two small sovereign nations. Uh, small island nations, um, which would hold asylum seekers while their claims were being adjudicated without actually letting them onto Australian soil. And once they were on these islands, they were essentially held in detention um, in what were you know, kept facilities, um, uh, often for months, often for years, while these claims were being adjudicated. And in a deliberate way uh, to to slow down and discourage um, future asylum uh, seekers. Um, so for instance, Australia launched a campaign called No Way, um, which was translated into multiple languages. Uh, these were pamphlets, uh, ads, radio ads, TV ads, all of which said basically, you will not receive asylum if you come try to come by sea. Uh, it was, it was the message was, do not try to come. Um, and the United States, um, as it begins, uh, so we're moving into the mid-teens, 2010, 2016, whoops, um, uh, uh, is encountering a sort of a similar situation where increasingly people who are arriving at the southern border of the United States, the border between the United States and Mexico, are uh, they're increasingly not uh, undocumented migrants who are seeking to cross the border illegally. They're coming to the border, and they're coming to the border crossing and saying, I would like asylum. Um, and the way it's portrayed in the media is uh, this is about undocumented migration or illegal immigration, but it's not. What the, the, what's happening at the southern border is a crisis of asylum. Um, and uh, many of those who are arriving at the border are not from Mexico, they're from Central America, they're from other parts of Latin America, or even from other parts of the world, um, who are arriving to the United States again to the border, to the border crossings, and asking for, um, for asylum. So um, this was already a crisis of sorts under the, the Obama administration. As soon as uh, Trump comes to office, um, he, his administration begins um, putting into effect a number of tools, again, to try and externalize asylum seeking. One of these was the Remain in Mexico um, uh, program, which uh, essentially said, if you come and ask for asylum at the US border, um, you'll be put on a list, uh, and your claim will eventually be adjudicated, but you 
have to stay on the Mexican side of the border while that claim was being adjudicated. Um, so this is with the agreement of the Mexican government. Um, it meant that asylum seekers were, um, had to find their own food and shelter on the Mexican side of the border, often in, in quite dangerous conditions. Um, so if the purpose of asylum is to provide protection from freedom of, of persecution, that's not what uh, was happening with the Remain in Mexico program. The other thing that, uh, that the Trump administration uh, did was sign a series of safe third country agreements uh, beginning with uh, Mexico and then with Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, each of which uh, in these agreements uh, indicated that they would be the refuge uh, for asylum seekers. So um, the idea behind asylum is that if you're traveling through a country which itself is not safe, then you can pass through it on your way to, um, to your final uh, uh, place of refuge. Um, and what the Trump administration was pressuring, uh, was doing with these countries is pressuring them into accepting the status of being the final destination for asylum seekers, um, uh, which, uh, uh, again, uh, a, 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 a problematic policy. Um, because each of these countries, Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, were, were themselves quite unstable, uh, quite unsafe, um, and themselves were sending asylum seekers to the United States. Um, but the idea, again, was to externalize uh, the border, to push asylum seekers away from, from the United States. COVID, uh, when COVID hit uh, in 2020, um, the Trump administration, um, in, uh, along with many other countries, uh, closed their border, uh, the US border. Um, many countries closed their borders. Um, and many countries also took this as an opportunity to uh, shut off, again, uh, opportunities for asylum. So uh, the United States, um, uh, in January of 2019, I'm sorry, this is, uh, no, this is a little bit later. Uh, so uh, this would have been in 2020. Um, uh, um, um, they, they, uh, the Trump administration put pressure on the CDC uh, to use a relatively obscure um, portion of the U.S. Health Code, uh, Section 267, of, uh, uh, Title 42. Title 42 basically said that if a migrant, uh, if, the, if uh, was posed a, a danger to the health uh, uh, of the United States, then they could be kept out of the country. So because COVID uh, was a, a transmissible uh, disease, uh, essentially they uh, the Trump administration um, issued kind of a blanket uh, 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 sort of prohibition on entry for every uh, migrant who was coming into the United States uh, and every asylum seeker. So anybody who entered could, was, could be immediately deportable. Um, uh, and uh, under the Biden administration, the two key policies, the Remain in Mexico program and Title 42, have remained in place. So the Biden administration abrogated the third safe country agreements uh, uh, with Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, but they have kept in place Title 42 and continued enforcing it. So anybody who arrives uh, can be immediately deported under health uh, uh, grounds. Um, and because of a series of court cases, uh, the Biden administration has been um, required to continue the Remain in Mexico program, and in fact has expanded it in certain ways to cover um, the rest of the Western Hemisphere, not just those who are arriving from Mexico directly. There's a cost to these, par to these policies. Um, uh, so these are the barriers along the U.S.-Mexico border, and uh, um, uh, so there's been a hardening of the U.S.-Mexico border now for a period of uh, at least 30 years. And if you look at this graph, this is the number of border patrol agents who are, are 
are employed um, by the Department of Homeland Security. And again, you can see this kind of dramatic increase in the number of personnel along the US uh, border as well. Um, so the, the cost is a human cost. Uh, so this is a picture that got quite a lot of play. The father and his daughter who died uh, crossing the Rio Grande in 2019. Um, and it's part of a larger pattern of border deaths along the US southern border. As the US has built these border walls, um, the border walls tend to be built along populated areas and essentially push migrants out into less populated areas, which are uh, either more mountainous or more desert-like, um, but in any case, harder to cross. So the purpose of the border wall is to make it of course, harder to cross, but by pushing people into these areas um, has increased the number of deaths as people try to cross the border. Likewise in Europe, um, as Europe has sort of uh, uh, entered into these arrangements to make crossing the Mediterranean harder for people seeking to cross the Mediterranean into Europe, um, there, um, there is, um, uh, you can see that the numbers of people who have been trying to cross has declined, but the numbers of deaths um, uh, have remained fairly constant. Um, and if, this is a chart from the IOM looking at deaths in the Mediterranean as well as in other, as well as the US. Um, and you can see that the Mediterranean is by far the deadliest uh, uh, crossing for migrants seeking asylum. Um, so many more people die trying to cross the Mediterranean. And um, the thing I want to point out here is that these policies are not accidental policies. They're deliberate policies. They're policies that are designed to, um, they're designed to discourage people and they're designed to discourage people by making it dangerous um, and by making it dangerous leading to death. Um, so these are conditions uh, during the Trump administration of uh, people being confined in close quarters, again, as they're seeking asylum. Um, this, there are a couple of these. But it, we're talking about overcrowded conditions um, uh, with men, women, and children uh, 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 um, that got a lot of attention at the time, um, uh, but have not, have not gone away. Right? So even under the current administration, um, you could, so you could argue that yes, we don't see pictures quite as drastically bad as these, um, but the policies remain the same, which are that uh, you have a set of policies in, across a set of OECD countries that are designed to discourage people from ever coming close. Um, so the policy is like posting a no trespassing sign and then saying, you know, if you cross this line, you'll get shot, um, and then blaming the person who tries to cross. Um, and it, this is a quote from Stephen Miller, who's a senior policy advisor in the Trump administration, where he's saying this is what the policies are for. The policies are designed uh, to discourage people, to make it more arduous, to make it more difficult, to discourage people. So <laughs> there's a way in which I could have sort of ended the talk here and said, you know, um, this is, uh, these are a terrible, terrible set of policies. What we're seeing is the erosion of a set of commitments that uh, Western democracies made to be welcoming to people who were in need, who are in need, um, and have reneged on those commitments. Um, but I want to make things a little bit more morally complicated um, because there's, a, because I want to understand why, why, why we're doing this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the erosion of democracy. So Germany um, is sort of the, uh, the hero, I guess, of the 2014-2015 uh, migrant crisis. Angela Merkel, again, uh, saying there's a moral commitment to admit refugees, um, asylum seekers, I'm sorry. Um, um, and uh, so this is a map of asylum uh, in Germany. Uh, and you can see 
that Eastern Germany in particular, uh, and we're really looking at Berlin uh, there on, on the right-hand side, accepts a disproportionate number of immigrants. Um, but immediately following, um, Germany holds a set of uh, elections in 2017, uh, and uh, the two main parties lose quite badly. I mean, they're, they're, they don't lose completely, but their their support erodes, and um, you see the rise of uh, the right wing AFD. Um, this is a, a map of support for the AFD in Germany, and you can see that particularly in what was the former East Germany, that support for the AFD is quite strong. Um, and if you look across Europe during this period, uh, sort of between 2013, 2017, you see the rise of a number of, uh, in each, well, many countries, uh, uh, of right-wing xenophobic parties um, that are um, taking advantage of this uh, crisis uh, to make the argument that, uh, again, an argument that here in the United States, we're quite familiar with that the borders are out of control, um, that uh, we need to focus on our own citizens, not be paying attention to uh, people who are not us, not like us. Um, and so, uh, again, this is a map from 2015, where you already see that Poland, for instance, by 2015, has essentially a majority uh, xenophobic right-wing coalition uh, Hungary and Austria soon follow. This is 2015, so within five years, uh, Hungary and Austria both have uh, majoritarian uh, xenophobic parties in control. Um, Hungary in particular, now that party is well cemented in, in power. Um, and uh, this is Hillary Clinton. This is Hillary Clinton giving a talk um, in 2018 uh, where she says that basically Europe needs to get its act together um, and get a handle on migration um, because migration is the flame. And she's talking that what migration is the flame that's lighting this right-wing xenophobic reaction. Um, um, there's, um, this is a continuation where she's saying, uh, look, uh, if you don't deal with this migration issue, it's going to continue to roil the body politic. And it's ironic because, of course, uh, Clinton lost to this guy um, in 2016, um, who was using that very same message. Um, so the question and the thing that makes this, I think, more morally complicated is, so are we willing to um, take this responsibility uh, for this commitment to people seeking asylum if the price for that is that um, um, it triggers this right-wing backlash. So do those things, are those things, do those things go hand in hand? Um, and, uh, and it, if you, at least if I look at it that way, then this becomes a more complicated question. It's not simply a question, it's not simply a question of um, that there's a clear moral obligation to accept those who are in need, who are asking for asylum, but then what the price of that is. What's the price of, um, of living up to our moral commitment? So I have made an argument, uh, here at Penn I've made an argument, that uh, w if there, if there are ways uh, of trying to balance these different claims, these different um, obligations. Um, and one of them would be to have, uh, think about some kind of asylum policy that would come with strings. And what do I mean by that? Um, so the numbers of asylum seekers um, has declined in Europe, but has not declined in the United States. Um, and in any case, where we are right now, uh, we're at a, a, either in Europe or the United States, it's clear we're at a kind of new plateau. These different policies to keep people at a distance or externalize our borders um, haven't worked perfectly. Uh, there are people who are still arriving um, and still asking for, uh, for some shelter. Um, so the argument that I've made is that we have to find a way to allow people to um, 
make the claim for asylum um, uh, and make it while uh, residing in a place of asylum, a place where they would like to uh, have asylum, um, and still um, be, be cognizant of what those domestic politics are. And so one way would be to um, allow for greater surveillance of people who are asking for asylum. So um, we all live with surveillance. Uh, we, we accept surveillance. Um, and increasingly, uh, UNHCR, and certainly uh, in Europe, um, are now using uh, biometric uh, documents um, as a way of tracking, keeping track of those who are in their, in their borders. Um, the United States has not done this. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's a morally fraught, morally, it's a complicated uh, solution. Um, but one that I would argue we need to come to grips with, we need to come to grips with the fact that, uh, that asylum is not going to go away. Um, and uh, that the numbers of people who are going to be asking for asylum are, if anything, going to increase. Um, so, uh, yep. Um, so these are uh, essentially climate refugees uh, from Bangladesh. Um, as we move into this new period of climate change, there are going to be increasing numbers of people who are displaced. We don't really have a framework for how to think about climate refugees. If you go back and think about the wording of the, the 1951-1967 um, accords, uh, the fear of persecution, what is climate? How, is, how does climate fit under the fear of persecution? Um, but that is going to be the driving factor for displacement and for the, and for the uh, people being uh, forced to move. Um, and we don't have a framework for it. And we don't have a framework for receiving them. Um, so there's, that's my rather bleak um, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of conclusion for this talk, except to say that this whole talk has been uh, with a, a kind of Euro and North American centric uh, perspective. So it's looking out from the OECD uh, toward the rest of the world and, um, and the, the, the story is a story again of trying to keep the world at arm's length. Um, but this isn't true. Uh, everywhere. So there are other uh, asylum stories, uh, asylum narratives around the world. One of them is uh, the displacement of people from Venezuela. Um, and you have between probably three to five million people displaced, um, uh, say, over the last uh, decade uh, from Venezuela throughout Latin America. One of the interesting things about that displacement is um, that they have, those people have received neither uh, a status as refugees or as asylum seekers because there's relatively free movement uh, among countries in Latin America. There's been a relative uh, sort of ease of entry for these displaced people. So the UNHCR, for instance, tracks them, at a, it counts them as displaced people, but they, again, are neither asylum seekers nor refugees. Um, Africa has entered into uh, uh, a relatively uh, a new uh, treaty uh, that allows for free movement among uh, African nations, uh, which also means that um, there aren't the same kinds of restrictions on uh, people on the movement of people who have been displaced. So this is all to say that the, the kind of asylum or refugee regime that I've been talking about isn't the only way of thinking about movement of people around the world. It's, 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 this, it's, it's the view from this particular vantage point that we're occupying here and uh, in this particular place. Um, 
where, again, our policy has been to try and keep people at arm's length. So, um, so that's my, my, uh, my sort of trying to inject a little bit of optimism is to say there isn't, there isn't just this one model. It's not just this one way of thinking about um, a movement of people. Um, and in some ways, uh, we've gotten trapped into a certain, uh, a certain way of, of looking at uh, the movement of people. Um, and with that, I will stop. Thank you. It was such a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to talk about the remain in Mexico policy. So I understand that kind of takes care of the burden that the United States will invite from Mexico. But does it take care of cases where there is a fear of prosecution so in the home country? Uh, this is the remain in Mexico policy? Yes. Yes. So uh, the, the the, 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 I want to say the terrible thing. The terrible thing about the Remain in Mexico policy is that uh, even if people have a credible fear of persecution and they arrive to a port of entry in the United States, they're still required to remain in Mexico while that credible fear, um, a credible claim is being adjudicated through um, the, uh, the DHS um, legal system, which is I will say, um, incredibly backed up. Um, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of cases waiting in the queue um, to be adjudicated uh, for asylum. So while those cases are being adjudicated, uh, those people, even if their, if their fear of persecution is real, um, which many of the cases are, they are not, not allowed entry. Hi. Um, so. This model that the, uh, say, the OECD co countries have is basically um, you uh, turn away refugees from your borders, you coerce or bribe neighboring middle-income countries to sort of keep them in detention and do, their dirty do your dirty work for you. And um, this strikes me as a very stable model, as something that, that works for rich countries given their priorities. But um, I do a lot of like climate modeling and climate mapping work, and you get, you get some really freaky predictions. Um, I think that it's likely that um, a billion people will be displaced by climate change by 2100. Um, and if that is true, then you have a, a, maybe an order of magnitude increase in the number of displaced people at any given time. So is, that, is the system still stable if that is the case? And if not, what would change if you have this sort of just, you don't get a change in the kind of people, just the scale at which it's happening. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, keep in mind that most displacement means either displacement internally within the country or displacement to an immediate neighbor. So this is why 85% of refugees are s still in the developing world. They're not in the OECD. Um, so people, when they move, tend not to move that far. Um, so climate migration will probably work in the same way. Right? Most people who are displaced will be displaced uh, either internally or nearby. Um, what the EU and the US uh, are really worried about um, is that fraction that decides uh, that uh, they would rather find refuge, seek asylum um, in their countries. Um, so when Afghanistan, when the, the, the government of Afghanistan collapsed uh, this year, the EU worry was uh, not really, I mean, it was not really about what was going to happen in Afghanistan. It was what the consequences were going to be for uh, asylum flows to the EU. That was what they were really worried about. Um, and, uh, and to keep those asylum flows in check. So, uh, you know, if uh, uh, the EU can manage to keep um, those 
people who are displaced as a result of climate, as a result of war, at a distance uh, through these policies that you've been following, these side deals with um, the gatekeeping countries, um, then that will be sufficient for them. Um, I'm sorry? I mean, look, I, I don't know what the strategy will hold, um, but that is that will be the strategy. So um, I had a couple of short questions. I wanted to ask about if there are examples of developed countries that have accepted relatively large number of asylum seekers without having a consequential like right-wing populist rise, I wanted to ask about if there's. Could you could you mind taking off your mask just a bit? Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to ask about if there's countries that have accepted relatively large numbers of asylum seekers without having a consequential rise in right-wing populism. Um, secondly, I was curious about. If beyond just surveillance, you think there's strings that can be attached to seeking asylum, um, whether those be like economic strings or restrictions on labor access, et cetera, that are still like morally defensible that might incentivize like greater amounts of asylum seeking. Um, and thirdly, I was curious about with, with people waiting in the US for an asylum hearing, my understanding is that that's usually in private detention facilities that are also horrible. How do those compare to remaining in Mexico? Hmm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I may ask you to repeat your second question. Um, so the first question was, you know, are there cases of uh, countries that have received large numbers of asylum seekers and haven't had this uh, xenophobic backlash? Um, and I'm trying to think about whether there are cases. Um, the, uh, in the developing world, there are lots of countries that have received um, uh, asylum seekers, or, uh, well, refugees, people who are spilling over into their borders without this kind of, 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 of backlash. So um, countries like Lebanon and Jordan and um, uh, uh, all uh, Turkey uh, have large uh, refugee or I mean, asylum isn't quite the right word, but the refugee populations um, and have not had a kind of xenophobic backlash. There have been xenophobic reactions for sure, uh, but it hasn't expressed itself publicly. Um, uh, so it is kind of an interesting question to think about, like why, why does um, uh, arrival of asylums in the West, in particular, the OECD countries, why does that trigger a, a, a backlash? Um, and I don't know that I have a great reaction to you, except that they're, except the legacies of kind of colonialism and racism and uh, the, the othering of these, of these asylum seekers. Um, the, uh, the third question, which was, um, so are conditions if you're applying, say, uh, from detention in the United States, how comparable are those to conditions in the border? Um, the conditions on the border are so when you uh, when you seek asylum at the border, um, you're given a number. A, a, to, you're, you're in a queue, so you're given a number, and you're basically told, uh, "Come back when we call your number." and uh, you're responsible for keeping track of where you are in the queue and when you're going to be called. Now, keep in mind that most people have no permanent residence, no form of communication, no cell phones. No, I mean, so how are they meant to keep track of when their number is being called up and where they are in the queue? Um, it's a and living where they have no housing and no um, no sustenance, and they're in on these border conditions, which themselves are dangerous. So, um, it's it's not a tenable uh, or humane system. Um, uh, it, the, if you're in a, a detention center in the U.S., um, again, uh, 
some of these some of these concerns are uh, at least you have some food, at least you have shelter. Um, you don't have a lawyer, so this is an issue at, in the United States in general. If you're making an asylum claim, there's no court-appointed lawyer. It's not a court system in the way that we think of like a civil court or a criminal court. Um, so there's no jury, there's no there's no lawyer unless you hire a lawyer, um, and the decision is made simply by one person, the person who adjudicates the, the case. And it's up to them. And often they make that decision on the basis of a 30-minute conversation. So um, anyway, yeah. Um, I'll get back to your second question. Yes. Hi. Um, the biometric tracking option that was mentioned. Yes. What does it entail, and what's the extent of it, and does it limit people from having a path to permanent residency and even citizenship? Right. Um, so, uh, so what? So, uh, if you were to say that the the cost of asylum were that you would be tracked. Essentially, you would be, you would, your presence would be surveyed. You would, you would be able to enter. Um, you would have essentially a contingent asylum. Um, you could stay in the United States, uh, but um, you could find a place of residence. You could, you could uh, uh, find family. You could uh, find a job, but you would be tracked. Um, that would be the price. Um, if your asylum claim were uh, it eventually adjudicated and you were given asylum, that would give you a pathway to legal permanent residence and to citizenship. But if your claim were denied, then you would be deported. Um, and that, again, is, uh, I mean, that is what happens in any case. But um, it's about giving people that that space for temporary asylum as their case is being adjudicated, which right now is what's missing. Um, right now what happens is people are either deported immediately, made to wait in a third country, um, um, or held in detention. Um, but it means that while their claims are being adjudicated, they really don't have asylum. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Jones Correa. Um, I had a question about the changing demographics in the US and how you foresee some of the policymakers revising the policies as um, the so called browning of the US occurs. And if you think that um, with there being more representative legislators in, in office, if you think that some of these asylum policies may change. That's the first question. Then the second one is, how, what can we do currently in order to prepare for climate refugees or climate asyl asylum seekers? So the, the first question is, do I think it's possible for the policy to change if we elect, say, more progressive legislators? Um, uh, <laughs> The short answer is yes. <laughs> um, the longer answer is um, I, it's been quite interesting to, to observe the Biden administration as it, as it uh, tries to address these issues. Um, and my read of the Biden administration is that it's trying to um, make these issues disappear and disappear not on the ground, but disappear from, from the media from, uh, to make them less visible. Um, so I don't know if you recall, there was um, the group of Haitian uh, asylum seekers who were, who were grouping at the border. Um, and the Biden administration's policy was basically to get rid of them, like put them on airplanes and send them back to Haiti. Um, and uh, it was a policy basically to, to again, to make, to make it disappear, um, to not make this visible. Um, because I, th I 
I, from what I can tell from my reading of what's going on in the internal political deliberations in the Biden White House, is they see immigration as a losing issue for them. That uh, there's there's no way for immigration to be to be a positive issue uh, in an election. So um, so they're trying to make it go away. Um, the question about climate refugees is uh, we, I think, collectively, I think, have to th rethink what it means to be, uh, to be f what, what is the reason to be fleeing? What, what is the reason for asylum? And um, the way that uh, the previous accords are phrased is that there is um, an actor from which a person is fleeing. It's a repressive government. It's um, it's a it's a they're they're being persecuted by someone some, um, and climate is not a someone, um, and so it, it means rethinking what what it means. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that illuminating talk. I have a question about. Um, refugee camps, in yeah. part because the, the map that you showed of displaced persons, you know, concentrated, say, in Central Africa or East Africa or yes. Middle East and so on and so forth. Um, and you have some of these massive camps, for instance, in Kenya, among the largest camps, right, or in Somalia. And and I'm, I'm, I don't know, but are you know, people, the displaced people concentrated in these places, are they seeking asylum in neighboring countries or are they just caught up in this space where, you know, perhaps you were waiting for political situations to improve in your country, but now you have, you know, for almost a generation of migrants living in these camps. In right a limbo without any national, you know, kind of recognition in these camps. So I wonder how you think about camps. This is, a, I mean, this gets us into refugees rather than asylees, mm. but um, the, the theory that the UN, the UNHCR, has about refugees is that people, when they're displaced, are temporarily displaced. There, there may be, they may be, uh, they may, uh, uh, again, kind of seek refuge in an adjoining country. UNHCR will provide aid. Will set up food and you know provide food, set up shelter. Um, but the idea is that eventually there will be a return. Um, this is in theory. Um, so um, the obligation of the receiving country is again to provide a place, provide allow to pr the provision of food, provision of shelter, education for children. But but what happens if you're an adult? What happens when you become an adult? Um, there's no provision for college education because you only are supposed to provide education while you're a child. There's no uh, access to jobs. So you can live on the camp, but you can't make a living. And again, the idea that this is all temporary. Um, but as you described, there are lots of these places now that are not temporary. They've become essentially permanent uh, places of settlement. Um, and many of the places in, again, Lebanon, um, uh, the Palestinian refugee camps, which are now two, three generations uh, old, um, are really talking about permanent residents. And the receiving countries uh, maintain this fiction that, that these camps are not permanent. Um, and the UNHCR maintains the fiction that they're not permanent. Um, but it means that you have people who are essentially living in limbo, who have no pathway, who are stateless, um, who have no pathway anywhere. Yeah. Hi. This is from one of our online viewers, and I think you touched on this just a minute ago, but. Isn't one of the problems that asylum, at least in the US, has been pushed and pulled and stretched to accommodate people in trouble who cannot really say that they are persecuted on account of the listed criteria? 
This makes Americans feel that asylum is being abused. Don't we need something other than asylum to accommodate people in trouble who need help but are not really eligible for asylum? Sort of what you were saying about climate change refugees. Right. So the US uh, has uh, other mechanisms for helping people in need who aren't asylum seekers. For instance, people who are displaced by um, natural disasters. Um, these are kind of temporary. They're meant to be temporary. Again, it's kind of like being a refugee. It's, these are meant to be temporary statuses that allow people to remain in the United States um, and then end up not being temporary. Um, but while you're in this temporary kind of limbo, uh, there's no pathway to permanent residence, no pathway to citizenship. Um, so we have hundreds of thousands of people in the United States who are in this temporary, temporary status, temporary protected status. Um, uh, what could the U.S. do? Uh, well, we could increase the numbers of people who we allow to apply, uh, uh, to come into the United States uh, as legal permanent residents, as, as immigrants. Um, that number has been kept capped for some time. We could, as a country, allow many more immigrants than we do. We don't. Um, and so we're sort of we placed an artificial cap on the numbers of people we allow to come in as immigrants. Um, um, and that creates, yes, that creates issues. Yeah. Um, I also had a question myself. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, Belarusian migration crisis that's happening right now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you think, what do you think the outcome would be? And um, do you think like they, EU responses on that, like by um, addressing like more, um, yeah. What do you think about the EU's response on that? Whether that was politically correct action or not? This is the the migrant crisis. Uh, referring to, can you give me an example of what you're thinking of? What? What you're talking about the current asylum seekers in the EU? No, no the one uh, in Belarus and on the border of Poland and Belarus. Um, uh, 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 uh. Uh, right. Um, this, this, that particular crisis has kind of been diffused uh, uh, because Belarus kind of backed down under pressure. Um, but this was a, 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 a Belarus was seeking to put pressure on the EU uh, by allowing. Um, asylum seekers from Central Asia to cross Belarus uh, to reach Poland and be able to make an asylum claim in the EU. Um, and there was a standoff at the Belarus and Polish border uh, to where the Polish military was uh, keeping these asylum seekers uh, away. Um, and they were out in the open and it was winter or becoming winter and it was cold. and. Um, uh, but again, as I said, eventually Belarus backed down um, and moved the asylum seekers away from the border. Um, but uh, again, uh, this is sort of an illustration of the EU uh, policy is to try and keep asylum seekers away from their borders, um, to, to not let them come until, and to um, use their neighboring, their neighbors, uh, to, as buffers to keep asylum seekers away from, from EU borders. Hi, thank you. We have a couple more from our online viewers. Uh, one is, how has Brexit affected EU policy and practice? Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I was going to, at one point when I was thinking about this talk, as start with a recent uh, incident where several dozen uh, people died crossing the English Channel from France to the UK. Um, and uh, basically, the French and the British uh, blamed each other. Uh, the French um, minister uh, immediately blamed border smugglers. Um, and nobody thought to think about why this might be a result of having an asylum policy that doesn't allow people to actually come in and, and um, ask for asylum. Um, 
but uh, this is kind of complicated. Uh, so Europe has a, a treaty that allows for free movement of people within Europe. Um, in 1989, it also signed a treaty, the Amsterdam Treaty, which um, creates a common external border. Um, as part of that common external border, uh, it also created a common external border police called Frontex. And uh, so when the UK was part of the EU, they were included as part of that border, um, and now they're not. So now the, the Frontex polices the border between France and the UK, and hence why the UK and France were blaming each other, because the EU, uh, sorry, the UK was blaming France uh, by saying basically Frontex wasn't doing its job keeping immigrant migrants away from us and vice versa. Um, and, uh, but what's happened is that Frontex now, its primary purpose is uh, to keep migrants away from Europe. And uh, they operate like, uh, like the US Border Patrol. Thank you. Um, what are ways to engage the talents and labor of those in asylum who are stateless for months and even years on end? Long-term displacement can erode one's self-worth and also drain resources of the receiving community. Are there any solutions to creating a win-win scenario where those who are seeking asylum can be productive in some fashion? Uh, can be productive. Uh, Yes, I mean, I think uh, I, I think I've touched on this in various ways to say that you know one of the problems with our current, particularly in the United States, our current uh, asylum process is that it doesn't allow people to uh, essentially uh, um, have temporary asylum. They're 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 either kept outside, in, in the case of the Remain in Mexico uh, policy, or they're, uh, they're in detention. Um, uh, there, there is a way, and it has in the past worked, that uh, if you have ties to the United States, if you have children who are underage, uh, you can be released and, and uh, released into the United States. Um, and that's probably a preferable policy. Um, again, I've suggested that, that that should probably be a, a policy for all asylum seekers. Um, again, with the understanding that, that asylum seekers uh, should expect that, that yeah, I keep on returning to the surveillance piece, but, um, but, but in any case, that, that asylum seekers should be allowed to to have asylum, um, and that is not our current policy. Hi, um, yes, so I actually had a question about the deaths of asylum seekers. I'm just wondering if anyone is being held accountable for their deaths, and if so, who is it placed on the country of the individual that they're seeking asylum from, or is it placed on the country where they are trying to head their final destination? So no one is being held accountable, is the short answer to that. So, um, so the, the, the insidious thing about this policy is if you make it really hard to cross, um, but you say, look, we're not actually causing the death. The person is choosing to make this dangerous journey uh, across this treacherous part of the border uh, into our country, then we're not responsible. They're responsible. Um, and it's this uh, absolution of responsibility that I think is problematic. It's a this policy that's designed to make it hard, to make it dangerous, and yet um, the countries involved sort of or sort of wash their hands of it and say, we're not responsible. 
um, and whether it's, that's true, whether it's in Europe or in the Mediterranean or in the US on the southern border. I'll be quick with my question. Um, how much, and this is another hypothetical, how much longer do you think it will, it'll be before the US decides to legalize asylum, asylees in the US or other immigrants given the falling birth rates um, the immense uh, fatalities we've experienced with COVID-19 and declining cities, um, major U.S. cities, and also um, across the flyover states in rural America? It's just, the question kind of assumes that that's the way that people think, that uh, our population is declining, or and so we should allow more people. Um, um, but much of the discussion on the part of this kind of xenophobic backlash is precisely our population is declining and we're at danger, like white Christian America is in danger, white Christian Europe is in danger, and therefore we should protect our borders even more, keep people out even further. Um, it's, the reaction is not, let's open our borders um, and allow more people in, it's the opposite. Thank you. Uh, oh, perfect. All right, just in time. So my question, um, although it's a little gruesome, I wanted to know about what happens to the bodies and like who takes care of that. Is that just like the terrain or do people, is there like um, an organization or department that deals with the bodies or are they just kind of left where they are? That's a morbid question. I know. <laughs> um, so if, if the body can be identified, it's often up to the consulate of the country to take, to, to, uh, take care of the remains. Um, there are, I think, also non private nonprofits that, that uh, can help with internment or re return of the remains to the country of origin. But it's uh, officially uh, the responsibility of the, um, of the consulates. Uh, please uh, join me in uh, thanking Professor Jones Korea for a fantastic talk. Um, <laughs> and I, actually, I'll, pa I'll pass it on. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you all for coming, and that's the end of the webinar. And it's also of the presence here. It's nice to see everyone thank in you. person. It's actually, uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs>